This is the Large Hadron Collider near Geneva, Switzerland. And large is in the half of it. It's a gigantic ring 27 kilometers long, the world's highest energy particle accelerator. It launches subatomic particles at close to the speed of light. We'll be learning something kind of awesome about how subatomic particles behave in this segment on Coulomb's Law, a formula that changed our understanding of how electric charges behave. So, how fast is the speed of light anyway? It's equivalent to traveling around the Earth seven and a half times in one second. The collider hurdles two beams of protons in opposite directions at close to this incredible speed. It takes that much energy to overcome the way protons repel each other. Remember, like repels like. But when the protons do collide, scientists can look at the debris from the collision, searching for traces of undiscovered subatomic particles or forces, keys to understanding the universe. So what does that have to do with Coulomb's Law? Well, without it, the Hadron Collider wouldn't really be that useful. Part of analyzing the data from the collider involves measuring how protons repel each other. We can do that thanks to Charles Augustin de Coulomb, and by figuring out some very basic facts about how particles behave, his law gave us the tools to develop not only the collider, but also all of this. But before we get to the details of Coulomb's law, let's talk about some other aspects of electromagnetism. Imagine a single electric charge sitting all by itself. This charge creates a field all around it called an electric field. The field is invisible, but we know it's there because it makes other charges move and act differently. The charge only exerts a force when there are other charges present. If it were in empty space, there would be no force. The force is a result of the attraction or the repulsion between the charges. It turns out that the strength of the electric field depends on two things that Coulomb figured out. The first is the magnitude of the charge creating the field. And the second is the square of the distance from that charge. Translation, the greater the charge, the stronger the force. And the farther apart the charges, the weaker the force. But no matter how far apart they are, the field still exists. Scientists believe it goes on forever. The idea that the bigger the charge, the stronger the force, and the farther apart the charges, the weaker the force, may seem obvious. But before Coulomb, no one had figured out exactly how the field and the particles were mathematically related. So at the time, it was a major breakthrough. Now, here is the formula for Coulomb's law. The electric force between two charges is equal to K times the absolute value of Q1 multiplied by the absolute value of Q2 all divided by r squared. K is the electric constant. It's equal to 9 times 10 to the 9th newton meter squared per coulomb squared. Q1 is the first charge in coulombs. Q2 is the second charge in coulombs. And r is the distance between them in meters. A coulomb is huge, by the way. To discharge one coulomb, you must move 6.25 times 10 to the 18th electrons. That's a lot. And there's a very interesting thing about what Coulomb found. His law, which measures the electric force between particles, and Newton's law, which measures the gravitational force between masses, are very similar. For gravity, the force between two objects with a mass is a constant g times the product of the two masses divided by the square of the distance between them. For the electric force, the force between two objects with a charge is a constant k times the product of the charges divided by the square of the distance between them. And both forces are inverse square laws. They depend on the distance between the objects in the denominator multiplied by itself. Also, both mass and charge are fundamental properties of matter. However, there is a difference. Mass only attracts, as you remember, while a charge can attract or repel. And speaking of attracting and repelling, Let's look at that in action. This is a Van de Graaff generator, which was invented in 1929 to generate electrostatic charges. It has a motor that makes this bell positively charged. And this, as you can see, is a balloon. It's made out of rubber, which is good at absorbing charges. I'm going to use this generator to positively charge this balloon. 
What do you think will happen when I move the balloon close to the bell after they're both positively charged? Well, let's find out. I'm giving this balloon a positive charge by making it touch the generator. Now, when I put it near the positively charged bell, it's repelled. Why? Because like repels like. Now, here's the really important part. The closer I move the balloon to the bell, the bigger the force. And the farther I move the balloon, the weaker the force. Look at what happens when I turn off the generator and discharge the bell. The bell stops repelling the balloon because it's lost its positive charge. And that's Coulomb's law in action. Now, let's look at Coulomb's law in a problem. We've got two charges, each three meters apart. The first charge is two times 10 to the minus 10 coulombs. The second charge is two and a half times that. We want to know, what's the electric field at each charge due to the other? And what's the electric force between the two? We know that the strength of the electric field depends on charge and the square of distance. The equation we'll be using is this. Electric field is equal to K times the absolute value of Q1 divided by the distance squared. The constant K is 9 times 10 to the 9th Newton meters squared divided by Coulomb squared. So the electric field at Q2 due to Q1 equals K times the absolute value of Q1, which is 2 times 10 to the negative 10th Coulombs divided by 3 meters which equals 0.2 newtons per coulomb. To find the field at Q1 due to Q2, use the same equation, but use the charge for Q2. This gives us a field strength of 0.5 newtons per coulomb. The electric field doesn't depend on the charge where the field is felt, only on the charge that creates the field. Now, what about force? Let's use Coulomb's law and see what we find. The electric force between Q1 and Q2 equals K times the absolute value of Q1 times the absolute value of Q2 divided by the distance between them squared. The electric constant K is always 9 times 10 to the 9th Newton meter squared by Coulomb squared. Q1 is equal to 2 times 10 to the negative 10 Coulombs, and Q2 is equal to 5 times 10 to the negative 10 Coulombs, and R is 3 meters. When we plug these numbers into the equation for electric force, we find that it is equal to 1 times 10 to the negative 10 newtons. Now there are very cool things about this result. One, it's the same magnitude on both charges, which is Newton's third law. Two, once we figured out the electric field, we only need to multiply that result by the charge experiencing the field to find the force. This is true in general, and makes it easier to find the electric force once we know the field and vice versa. One more interesting thing about the history of understanding electric charge about 125 years after Coulomb, a physicist named Robert Millikan found a way to measure the charge of a single electron and establish it, not the atom, as the smallest measure of electric charge. Using this funky looking chamber, after all, it was 1909. He used a perfume bottle to spray electrically charged drops of oil and measure the rate at which the drops moved. With the data, Millikan concluded that each drop had a charge that was a multiple of 1.59 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And that's important because it established that the electron charges were all integer multiples of a single fundamental unit. They were quantized. You've heard of quantum mechanics, right? It has to do in part with particles that cannot be broken down. For example, let's imagine that these Legos are electrons. I can have one Lego or I can have two Legos, but I cannot have one and a portion Legos. And it's the same deal with electrons. You can have one or five or a trillion electrons, but you cannot have a fraction of an electron. They only come in whole numbers. And that's a good place to stop. We've learned about Coulomb's law, which measures the electrical force between objects. And we've learned that electrons are a basic particle that cannot be broken down. That's it for this segment of Physics in Motion, and we'll see you next time. For more practice problems, lab activities, and note-taking guides, check out the Physics in Motion Toolkit.